friends. I'm glad you came to play. Our fun and learning never end. Yeah, 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 yeah. Did you get your invitation, dog? Did you get your invitation to the memorial coming up uh, next week on the 11th? I got mine today when I was at work. Um, I came home and this piece of paper was sitting on my door. Um, <laughs> ironically, no trolls have answered my challenge. So this goes to show a lot of trolls on these things. Um, just basically trying to convince themselves. That's all they're trying to do, people, man. Trolls are doing nothing but trying to convince themselves that they still have the truth. But deep inside, they know deep inside... That something is not right. That's why they are not on JW.org. They're on YouTube watching videos blaspheming the organization that they believe is the truth. They would never answer my challenge. And I, you know, I offer them a million dollars. They would never do it because they are scared that if they do, they will have to, um, it will call for action on their part. They don't want that. But anyway, I got this um, invitation to the memorial. Interesting enough, um, the witnesses know that um, I live here. So you're bringing this to my door, and you know that I live here. And you know when the, I know when the memorial is. It's interesting. I don't. I don't get that. I. <laughs> I really don't get that. But um, I've seen this on a website, a, a Facebook page. Um, someone mentioned this. That um, and I don't want to make too much of it, but. If you look closely at this picture, right? I don't know who drew it. Um, I don't know what they were thinking when they drew it. But for some reason, we should be paying attention to the paradise ahead, right? Up here. All folks should be here. But these people, these these individuals looking down at this um, grassy note. This big old lump in the grass. And I'm not sure. Um, maybe they're walking through tall grass. But the way they drew it is the fact that there's a big lump in the middle of these two group of people. And all these individuals on this side are looking down at this grassy note right here. Everyone else on this side looking at them, looking at this grass. Um, I'm not sure. I don't want to make too much of this. Uh, I don't want to make too much of this picture. Uh, but normally back in the day, back in the day, um, when they gave invitations to the memorial, it had a picture of Jesus on it. And then on the back, they had a, a picture of the, the wine and the, and the bread. But for some reason this year, um, they're not even saying what the the special event is. Uh, they're just saying you invited and look inside for the details. But um, to get on this big old lump in the middle of the grass, um, what's interesting, and you can look it up, and I don't want to um, put any thoughts in the illustrators of this page, but slang, in slang terms, all right, Slang term. There's a slang term. If you ever say grassy lump, okay, what that is referring to is a woman with a hairy vagina. All right? That's all I want to say about that. But interesting, I've seen that on the page, uh, um, and I just wanted to bring that out, that everyone, instead of, they, they survived Armageddon, right? And instead of looking at the whole picture up here, they focusing on the grass, believe them. Um, don't know what they're looking at. But what I want to do, I want to go into whether or not Jehovah Witness is really commemorating Jesus' death the way he said to. Because what's interesting and what's sad is that a lot of Christians today are not even imitating the Christians the way they actually worshipped or the way they actually gathered in the first century. A lot of Christians today are basically going off tradition passed down from Constantine time onward. Even the worship on Sunday. All right. When Constantine supposedly became a Christian or he made Christianity legal, he still worshipped the sun God. And Sunday was actually a holiday to Constantine. To the Romans, Sunday was a holiday. All right. It was a day of the sun. Day of the soul. It was a day of the sun. All right. So after a while, after millennials and after generations of doing traditional things and doing things by tradition and empty rituals, things become history to people and they feel that this is how it always was. But what you need to do is go beyond Constantine, go beyond the Nicene Creed and go back to the first century. The book of Acts tells us how the Christians worshipped, how they um, 
evangelize and spread Christianity. But a lot of people, they stop at the Nicene Creed. Oh, well, the Nicene Creed talks about the Trinity. There it was. They always believed in the Trinity. Um, Nicene Creed celebrated the, started the day of the Easter, or the day that they supposed to celebrate Easter on. And that's how it always was. But people need to go back to the basics, man. Go back to what the Bible say. Study the history of the um, Christian, um, the cult of the Nazarene, as they were referred to. Study that, man. Stop going to these church fathers and things like that. Even though I'm not saying they were all false, but I'm saying go to the actual word, man. You want to know about Jesus? Look at his words, man. You want to know about his fault? Look at their words, man. You're talking about these church fathers. people who have voices has to do with wealth, man. People follow the gold. Even today, people go to churches based on how big the pastor's car is or how big, I mean, his car, how big his house is, how big the church is. You know, the the accolades of the pastor, not really the messenger. So by the time all the, the apostles died, the church fathers, all these were basically, um, Basically, they were in society. They were, um, what do you, what do you call it? They were the big guns in society. So, I mean, they, they voices automatically going to be heard. We got to stop looking at people outside the Bible and saying, oh, that's the authority. All right. But anyway, what people don't realize today is that the early Christians used to have something called a fellowship meal or a agape meal. Christians used to meet inside houses. Not no buildings, man. They used to meet inside houses. If a Christian had a big enough house, the Christians would meet. And it wasn't always necessarily 50,000 people. It could have been 12 people in that one house. It could have been 10 people. It could have been 100 people. How much that house could accommodate, that's how much that congregation made up. All right? During these love feasts, what they would do is they would come together, sing, pray, um, have a meal at the end of it, um, do worship, um, Someone would, um, the gifts of the spirit would flow throughout each of the members and each of them contributed. They would speak in tongue and do these different things. All right. When I was younger, I went to a Pentecostal church, um, uh, with a family friend. Now, none of my family is Joe Winner. They never came, never joined. Um, I used to preach to them, but they never joined. Um, but I used to go to a Pentecostal church and I would say that what they would do, <laughs> they would sing, pray, dance, um, speak in tongue, right? And then at the end of the meeting or the church service, which lasted for <laughs> 24 hours, and then you, <laughs> man, you let even Pentecostal church 24 hours, then the preacher's singing, he preaching, you think it's over, he start a whole new session. I'm like, man, when is we getting out of here? But after the church is over, they would have a fellowship meal. But guess what? <laughs> you would have to go buy a plate. <laughs> it wasn't bringing up... <laughs> The thing is, the Christians in the first century would all bring their food to the meetings, to the houses, and they would eat together as a fellowship, man. Remember, food, fun, family. That was the ingredient of a Christian meeting back in those days. And I say fun, meaning that the meetings were actually um, edifying, man. The meetings were not, you go there and leave and, oh, man, that was such a good meeting. No, the meetings of the first century were edifying. Each person contributed to the whole body of the meeting. You understand what I'm saying? But today you go to Pentecostal, they have a, a fellowship meal at the end, but you got to buy the plate, man. What, what's up with that? Um, but anyway, getting back to this. The uh, memorial, what people would do at the memorial, for those who have never been to a Jehovah's Witness memorial, what you're going to do, you're going to go in there, you're going to sing a song, you're going to pray, or the person in front is going to pray. They're going to say why Jesus died. Most likely going to start with Adam, why he sinned, why he died, why he had to die. Then they're going to talk about what the two emblems mean, the bread and wine, what they supposedly mean, and um, what they got to do with what we're doing. Then they're going to um, pray again over the first thing they're going to pass about. They're going to pass some unleavened um, bread, look like crackers. They're going to pass it to the audience, and guess what? You are not going to eat them. You are not going to eat them. What you're going to do, you're going to pass them around. If you got kids, you're going to make sure that the kids don't touch the plate. You're going to show them, but you're going to head it so far up they can't touch it, but you're going to pass it over to the next person. And they're going to do that through the whole audience. Until it finally goes to the last person, they take up to the person and say, see if he's going to eat. No, he ain't going to eat. It's just, you know, empty ritual. And then they're going to do the same thing with the cup. Pass a cup of wine around, and then everybody's going to pass it around. But guess what, man? In the first century, that's not what it was about. 
What you got to understand is that everything in the New Testament was prefigured in the Old Testament. What do I mean by that? For anyone who studies the covenants, this is one thing I really got into. The sin offering, the peace offering, the um, the tent, the festival, the tent, the tabernacles, and all these other things. Is that in the Old Testament, Old Covenant, what the Jews would have is a um, fellowship offering. Um, the New World Translation calls it a communion sacrifice. And some translations call it a peace offering. This was one of the only offerings that you gave to God that you could actually partake of, okay? Um, the burnt offering, you would give all that to God. But this fellowship offering and this communion offering or this peace offering, you would give some of it to God, but the rest, you and the priest who was offering that, would go sit down and have a meal. What this prefigured was the offerer, the priest, and God having a meal together, a fellowship. It'll be like you eating a meal with God. That's what the communion or the fellowship offering was about. And this was a voluntary offering. This was an offering of thanksgiving, like, thank you, God, for everything you've done. I would like to eat and have a fellowship with you. Now, we're going to bring it up to the first century after Jesus died. What Jesus instituted was a memorial or a, um, he instituted a meal that was served as a remembrance of his death, what he did. And after he died, the disciples would always meet together every week to celebrate or commemorate what Jesus did. And while the Jehovah's Witness do this celebration once a year, you gotta understand that different religious denominations do it at different times. I think the Seventh-day Adventists do it every six months. I think they do. The Catholics obviously do it every, every week. That's, that, when I was going to Catholic church, that's all we did. We just went to the church. The priests go up there and do something, and, and we go up there and get the um, get the um, wine and crackers. Um, that's all we did. I don't remember too much any service at the Catholic Church. I just remember going up there doing the um, uterus or whatever it's called, the, the um, Lord's Supper. Okay. Um, the Baptists they do theirs the first Sunday of every month. So it 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 ver it varies between the denomination. Okay. Um, Jesus didn't really say when they were supposed to do it. it. Just says often as you do it. Okay, when you do it. Okay, the thing is, do it, man. Don't let a don't let a year go by without you doing it because we get so bogged down. Even God knew that the Israelites would get bogged down with the everyday life. He said, "You gotta don't go a week without remembering what I've done." You know what I'm saying? Set a day, set a day aside. Okay, uh, but anyway. Um, according to Acts 20, verse 7, this is what it was about, okay? And today, a lot of religions are doing it wrong. I'm sad, I gotta say that. A lot of religions are doing it wrong. But Acts 20, verse 7, um, this is Paul talking to the congregation at Turris. He says, on the first day of the week, we gathered with the local believers to share in the Lord's Supper. Paul was preaching to them, and since he was leaving the next day, he kept talking to midnight. So, on the Lord's Day, whatever day that was, uh, Christians, they think it's Sunday, some think it's Saturday. Whatever day it was, it was once a week that the Christians come together in the evening and have a celebration or a meal, a fellowship meal, right? Well, all the Christians would come, and not all in one place, but a group. They would come into a person's house. They would come sing, praise, worship, and at the end of that, they would break bread or commemorate the Lord's Supper. But they would do it once a week. Now, I'm not saying that that's how all Christians do it, but if you want to, if you want to imitate the Christians of the first century, that's what you would do. It would be a meeting of fellowship, okay? And as you're eating your meal and breaking your bread, you would come together and talk. You will fellowship. You will get closer. And this is what Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 says. Do not forsake the gatherings, but come together and incite and encourage. You do that by fellowship. You don't do that by going and listening to one person talk, sing, pray, and go home. No. You go together. You come and you touch. You hug. You kiss. You, you fellowship, man. You eat together, man. You get to know a person by eating together, right? So it says that in Acts 20, verse 7, they would come together on the Lord's Day and celebrate this meal, man. But not at the memorial. Not at the memorial of Jehovah's Witness. 
Um, in fact, a lot of times, it's like they cram them together. A lot of times, they're using the same building for three different congregations. So by the time they get through praying, they tell you, brothers, we have to strip the gallery for the next meeting. So you have no time after the memorial to even fellowship. All you're going there is listen to a public talk and pass around two emblems, the empty ritual, which is not following what Jesus said or intended to do. All right. Um, I don't have time to read the whole chapter, but if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it'll go into what Paul was saying, um, how they practice it. All right. Um, and as I said, tradition and rituals, after a while, when it becomes empty and mindless, you start to take it for granted. And Paul started to see that in Corinthian congregations. So you have to write a letter telling them that when you come and celebrate the Lord's meal, you guys are doing it wrong. You guys are just coming and eating. Some of you eating before you come, so you don't even have time to fellowship because you're so full. He said, come and eat together with the friends, man. Okay? And the same thing, same thing today at the memorial. Um, they don't take the time to actually fellowship during the memorial. They're up there listening to what this man is talking about. A lot of stuff, it's redundant information. I'm going to say redundant, but it's stuff we already heard before. It's stuff we already know. It's not even adding to our insight or it's not even inciting us to even, um, what do you say? Um, to really reappreciate what Jesus does because we already know it. You see what I'm saying? Okay. Um, so that's basically what the memorial or Jesus stuff, see the sacrifice really was. It was kind of a, a, a repackaging of the fellowship offering in ancient Israel, where that the disciples or the, um, all the Christians would come together on a set day and partake of Jesus' blood and body as a fellowship offering to him. Oh, I should call it offering, but a communion meal with Jesus. It's like you're setting that day apart as a believer to come together and eat the bread and wine, but you're doing it like you're doing it with Jesus right there in that room with you. That's what the Lord's Supper was really about. I think Matthew 26, 29 tells us that Jesus said, I would not eat the fruit of the vine until I sit in the kingdom. So while you're doing it down here on earth, Jesus physically um, symbolically doing in heaven, but he's doing it right there while you're gathering together. You see what I'm saying? Um, and that goes along with Ephesians 2, verse 13 to 18. I, I'm, I'm not going to go through much to this. I just want to, um, really, you guys can read this yourself, go through it a little bit on your own time. But, um, Ephesians 2, verse 13 to 18. Um, it says, but now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. You see, we're united through the blood of Christ, and that wine represents the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. Okay, so this goes into the peace that Jesus brought to Jews and Gentiles and all the people. And that's what we're doing. We're having a peaceful meal or a fellowship meal between all the brothers and sisters throughout the earth. We do it on a set day. Do it on a set night. They do it at nighttime. Okay. Um, let me read one more scripture today. And this is this kind of emphasize the love meal. It's called an agape meal or a, a, a love a, a fellowship meal that the first century Christians used to do. But Jude 12. Okay. This is the last scripture I'm going to read. Okay. Jude verse 12. It says, when these people eat with you in your fellowship meals, commemorating the Lord's love or celebrating the Lord's evening meal, commemorating his death and resurrection, they are like dangerous reefs that can shipwreck you. They are like shameless shepherds who care only for themselves. They are like clouds blown over the land without giving any rain. They are like trees in autumn that are doubly dead, for they bear no fruit and have been pulled up by the roots. So again, there were some people in the first century that during these fellowship meals that the Christians had, there were people coming in disturbing and doing it for the wrong motive. Okay? And it's the same thing that they were doing now. Doing this for the wrong motive. This is not to commemorate Jesus, man. 
This memorial is not to commemorate Jesus because how you commemorate Jesus? How you have a fellowship meal with Jesus and your brother and sister if you don't even eat? Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Do what in remembrance of me? Pass the plate around? Pass the glass around? Hurry up and leave so the next congregation come in? No. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Eat the, eat the bread. Drink the wine. Fellowship. Sing. Praise and worship. Fellowship with me as you come together. So that's all the time I have today. I couldn't go through too much um, in this video, but just want to know, you know, if you go through one of these, man, you want you want to go to this, just know this is not commemorating Jesus. That's why they took Jesus off of this, man. This is just um, a, a public talk that they're inviting the majority of people to, and then you get a second one on April sixteenth. So you get a, you get a, um, you get two you get two talks, two invited to two talks through the year. All right, that's all it is, and then. Somebody's going to come up to you, ask if you're studying, and you're going to get um, invited to a study. Because they, they, tell, they tell that in the meeting. If you see somebody who you haven't seen before, ask them to have a study. All right? So, um, there you have it, folks. Um, my main thing is if you want to study Christianity, man, stop looking at these church fathers. Stop looking at the Constantine, Nicene Creed, or the churches that came after um, Constantine um, hijacked Christianity. Um, or the false version of it. Look to the Bible and study the history of the Christian religion, man. You might learn something, man. Thank you for your time, and I am is out. What's up? Good morning. Are you prepared for Jehovah's return? Because if you're not, I have a pair for you that Well, you head dead motherfucker. Come on, sister. Come on, sister.